thank you all for being here. Thank you for the, the studio audience. Thanks to the uh, people watching at home. Um, so we're going to talk about, in theory, uh, alts, but I will tell you we will be much broader than that. Uh, we'll talk about almost anything. If you have questions at the end, I guess we'll be taking them online. Uh, in the audience here, if you're desperate to ask a question, just raise your hand and we can handle that also, um, as long as it's kind of relevant. So our two guests, Josh Wolf, Mike Taylor, why don't you guys give us a brief introduction, although they're, they're, they're famous financiers, you should know them already, but in case you were under a rock, they will give us a brief story. Uh, Josh Wolf, co-founder and managing director at Lux Capital. We are a $4 billion uh, venture fund. We're between New York and Menlo Park and do everything from healthcare to aerospace, biotech to cutting edge material science, robotics automation, and we start companies de novo from scratch. We fund later stage investors, uh, later stage investments, uh, and uh, uh, we'll be talking, I think, through this about some of the crazy stuff that we're, we're funding and finding now. I'm Mike Taylor, by the way, a pleasure to meet you. You too. So. Honestly, our first time. And, and, we, and we share some conspiracy theories that we're not going to talk about publicly. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mike Taylor. So happy to be here uh, with our wonderful group. And uh, I run the Pink Fund for uh, Simplify. And it is predominantly a healthcare fund. And previous to that, uh, I ran a hedge fund for most of the past 20 years. Uh, long, short healthcare, and uh, and right now I do a little of everything, and I run a family office. And they put me as the monochromatic guy amongst all the colorful characters. So mm -hmm. it's good. So, why don't I start by asking a question, um, kind of out of the blue? What do you guys think about legalized gambling? Do you believe in the New York State Lottery? Do you believe in uh, tribal? Uh, gambling being allowed? Is that, is that a public good or, 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 or a public bad? Wow. I, I, I'm generally on the libertarian side here that people should be free to do what they want. I think that you need appropriate um, education for people because it's mostly a tax on the poor. Um, when you think about the lottery system itself, most of that money is intended to go towards state education, but um, most of the people that are playing the lottery are the poorest. Now, of course, they have the probability, low probability of hitting a high magnitude outcome. But um, I, I think as long as you have education, people should be free to do what they want. But uh, it, it, it unfortunately can have predatory aspects. I agree on the predatory part. I don't think the states should be involved at all in lotteries. Um, biologically, scientists did drug development. Uh, gambling releases uh, endorphins. And uh, people actually do get uh, sort of addicted to it. And, uh, and it, 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 it's a lose-lose. And it is really bad for the population. Now, so far as gambling in general, reservations, things like that, I'm a libertarian too. I think that the private entities should be able to do what they want. But uh, states, for the good of the people, they should not be doing this. Hmm. I think it is a disservice to our public. I agree with that. I, I mean, I look at it that, um, you know, uh, if you go, the worst, bet, the, the worst bet you can make in Vegas is slot machines. You get 70% back theoretically over time, and, and state lotteries are under 50%. So it, it's worse than, than gambling with the mafia. Uh, yet states go and do this with the idea of helping schools, I guess. But I mean, I view this as a regressive tax. Uh, against society uh, because the poorest people tend to do it. And I'm really not sure the government should be involved in, in you know, harming the, those that can't protect themselves. I think it is a public policy government should be supporting. So the question that I'm going in a circle to get to is, should we be allowing, should the government be allowing civilians, non-professionals, non-accredited investors to have access to private funds, private equity, alternate investments? I mean, or should the government say, no, you can't do that. You have to be qualified and be able to afford to lose your money to go and do that. Because both of you are involved in, in you know, as, as we are, and to simplify, you know, basically offering sophisticated ideas to the public. So that was a roundabout segue, but what do you think of that? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, slot machines, as you note, are uh, embedded negative expected value, but other games that are more pari mutuel, which effectively is what the stock market is, and certainly the private market, I think are different. Um, uh, the, there's a discriminatory, pra a discriminatory practice, I think, of not allowing people to participate in private markets where you do have some of the greatest wealth creation. And I actually think that one of the great causes of inequality in our society is not just an income issue, but a wealth and ownership issue. And if 
people that uh, were able to have, uh, whether it was a national savings account or some mechanism where they were able to put money, not just into the public markets, but to have some small allocation into the private markets where you get these disproportionate, more inefficiently priced assets, which give you the promise, as you see in some of the greatest people on the Forbes uh, or Fortune 100 list um, that didn't inherit their wealth were entrepreneurs. And being able to participate in that economy, I think, is something that, that would end up reducing the wealth inequality uh, that we see in the country. So you think being a, the barrier of being an accredited investor should be dropped? Yeah, I, I think you want education. You'd like people in the same way you need a, a, a driver's license and you have to take a test to be able to operate a motor vehicle that could put other people's lives at risk. You don't want to uh, create systemic risk in a system, but you do want to have widespread participation, and I think more education is better. Now, you saw this a little bit in recent years, in part because of stimulus, in part because of technology, with people participating in Robinhood and these meme stocks, and I think most of the time they lose their money and they gain an education and then they end up maybe re-entering the markets or opt out. And I think that that ends up being tragic because there are predatory practices, mostly of them marketing from some of these companies to induce people into the markets. But I do think that if you have education and maybe some basic test uh, where people um, like uh, driver's ed and, and uh, getting a driver's license, you should be able to participate in markets more freely. Mike, what do you think? Well, if I recall correctly, that sort of accredited investor legislation was put into act around 65, isn't that about it? And, uh, and the, the, you know, it's like you have to have a million dollars net worth. That was a lot of money in 65. And as all of you, we're in New York City, right? It's still a lot of money, come on guys. <laughs> well, not if you're buying an apartment in New York City, right? I mean, you get a doorknob and a shoebox and you call it home, right? Uh, so it's not what it used to be. And so just by that inflation with the barriers being fixed, uh, many, many, many more have access to those private, because there's so many that qualify now. Um, I will say so far as qualification, I think which has hurt our markets badly is allowing anyone to invest in derivatives. You know, a $1,000 Robinhood account, and you can check the box and now trade options. Uh, 20 years ago, you had to have serious assets to be able to trade in that. Now you just check a box. And so I actually think the barriers on that qualification has come down an awful lot for uh, individual investors to invest in things they do not understand that can be extremely dangerous, intoxicating when it works. But when it doesn't, such as current, current markets, they can get cleaned out. And I think that that's a disservice to them. So I wish there was a sort of a qualification for at least derivative markets uh, there. And I really don't have a great answer for uh, so far as accredited investors in private equity. Uh, I think net-net as a as million dollars isn't what it was, and every year it'll be less valuable. Uh, more and more and more will qualify. You know, eventually your, your kids may have a starting salary of a million dollars a year if uh, things continue the way they are. You, you've, you've been a long, sophisticated derivatives trader, uh, option trader. I mean, do you have a view that the retail should be able to have widespread participation? I, I, I mean, as a public policy concept, I'm troubled when the government allows people who are unqualified to, to make decisions. And the core reality is this, like, what, what is the average IQ in the country? Do you know what it is? 100. By definition, it's 100. And therefore, half people in this country are below 100. Should this half the population, and I'm not saying they're good or bad people, I'm just saying, are they sophisticated enough to make decisions to invest in either of your funds? I suspect not. And, and therefore, I'm concerned about that. Now, what's different at Simplify, for those of you watching, uh, as, as you recognize, is what we do is we take the ordinary uh, beta and we add in positive convexity generally. We improve the portfolio's profile where you have better gains and cushioned losses. You're buying the option, you're buying the optionality. What worries me is when people get involved in negative convexity where they have limited gains and unlimited losses. There's lots of ways you could sell options directly um, when you buy a junk bond. I mean, that is a classic short option. The most you can make is par, and you can lose the whole thing. Um, should we protect people from that? Um, I suspect yes, but then again, you know, since I split time between New York City and California, where in New York you can't buy a, a large soda pop, and in California you can't smoke on a public street, uh, maybe that's a little too much. Um, but but there, there is a line somewhere where the government's supposed to come in and be helpful. But that's Dodd-Frank, you know. If, if, if you don't have rules, you don't have a game. 
And a lot of what happened in 07, 08, 09 was we did not have rules to, 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 to play the game by, and, and it got over levered. How do you gentlemen, assuming you guys pick good things and you're smart guys and, and the things you offer are, are useful and helpful to people, um, whether they're qualified or not, how do you guys d define value? What do, you, what do you look for? What, what makes something interesting to you? Oh, OK. Um, let's see. On value, how I, you're, so you're asking how it, it, I would it, pick it, an investment. It can be growth also. I, I don't mean value investing. I mean, I mean what, what, what attracts your attention to want to go put money into it? OK. Um, well, I actually look at it differently than many of my peers. Uh, when I ran a hedge fund, I had a different approach. Um, I'm always fixated on what investors have to buy or have to sell rather than what's actually going to happen at the company. And I think about that an awful lot because there is so much benchmark anxiety. And a great example is Tesla. And I'll just cite that where nobody owned it. It got added to the S&P and you had an incredible truckload of investors plowing into this because they had to mirror the benchmark. In fact, I think it was the biggest ad to the S&P ever by market cap, and it actually had gotten up to a trillion dollars in market cap. You know, much more value in Tesla by market cap than Berkshire Hathaway, much more. And this is for a business, the auto business, which has a low single digit net yield at the end of the day, that's the business. But they didn't care about that. The investors that were plowing into it didn't care about that. They were terrified they would underperform their benchmark. And so they didn't care. We have to go or try to get equal weight. And they rammed this thing to the moon. And we're now living with the aftermath of that, where they're saying to themselves, oh my goodness, what did I just do? Right? And, and that, those are the things that I spend a lot of time on. It's exactly that thought process. Oh my god, I'm missing it. Oh my god, what did I do? How can I capitalize on that? Which is a very, very different approach from just a bottom-up fundamental, oh, this company's going to beat, this company's going to miss. And I think that investors do their, like a portfolio manager, do their investors a disservice by not thinking about that aspect too and being too bottom-up on the company and what it's going to earn. And you forget, sometimes it doesn't matter because there's nobody on the other side to buy it or sell it who cares. And that is the missing ingredient, I believe, to superior performance in a hedge fund or a mutual fund. Josh, one second. So your horizon is, I know yours is very long. What's your horizon? Is it weeks, months, years? Like how, how far in advance are you looking? It depends on how big the idea is, right? If I'm playing with uh, benchmark changes and, uh, oh, this company is going to do well on the quarter, which we do think about in a bottoms-up approach. But where is it in the benchmark, and how are all the other benchmarking individuals going to react to this information? Because I'm assuming that I know it usually first or early, because I'm a specialist. I should know it before the generalists, or figure it out at least. And so that will determine my sizing. Uh, if I realize, even if it's five, six, seven, eight percent move, sometimes I'll be a majorly sized position, knowing that when they figure this out, they're going to run this up eight percent, and that's it. And so that would be a short-term trade around a quarter or an event, something like that. But my really big idea is I look at the implied discount, and the implied discount is essentially value of the asset here, value of the asset in the future, what I think it's going to be based on their future cash flows, and then you back it out and say, well, what is this asset pricing in right now? And what I'm looking for, uh, my longer term idea is I'm literally looking for minimum five bagger. Uh, that's a 500% return, uh, what I'm usually looking for. And uh, I've been fortunate in my career to find many. Um, and, and, and honestly, I'll say it, my, my 20 bagger returns or more, I only find them about twice a decade. <laughs> yeah. Josh, what do you look for? 
<clears throat> a few different dimensions. I mean, obviously, value is buying something today for less than what it's worth. Uh, in our case, it's often not that there's an asset with cash flow and fundamentals that somebody has mispriced. It's something that somebody hasn't priced at all. We're often the founding investor in a company. We're investing in something that people don't yet know about, a technology. And uh, our time horizon is typically a decade. Uh, we're investing over a period of five years in any given fund, and then we're looking to exit and, and liquidate either through M&A or a public offering of companies. Uh, if you look at one of our funds, let's say it's a billion dollars in size, if a 2% position, $20 million investment, uh, we're typically looking, can that company return the entirety of the fund one time over? And so to return a billion dollars, we'd have to have an outcome that might be $3 billion and own 33%, which is hard to do, but typically we own between 15 and 20% of our companies, means you have to have a $5 billion outcome. So I have to look at something when we're just in the inception stage and imagine that this could actually be a $5 billion company, which is very improbable. Um, there's this great painting, I think it was Magritte, called Perspicacity, and it shows a painter painting um, uh, this, this painting while he's, it's sort of a meta thing, and he's, he's looking at an egg, but the thing that he's painting is this bird breaking out of the egg, and so he sees what could be. We have to believe many of the things that we invest in before people, uh, uh, others understand. And so whether that's in cutting edge biotech, whether that's in aerospace, whether that's in defense, whether that's in material science, whether it's in some crazy area of brain machine interfaces, we're typically making a bet that the thing that we have identified and found is going to be really valuable to other people in the future. And we're often contrarian in that sense because in venture, everybody herds around a particular sector. And we always like to say that we like to invest in stuff and be contrarian, not because for the sake of it, but we want people to agree with us just later. And so we're trying to anticipate in some years, is the thing that we're making going to be really valuable and be recognized for being valuable? The, the traits that we're looking for in a company, I generally want a moat around technology. I want an inventor to say, you know, we have created this thing and it's patent protected and nobody else in the world can do what we're doing. So there's some value there, there's some exclusivity, some monopoly on a capability, composition of matter, a method patent, some, some uh, 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 crazy process. The people, there's often a trait there which is very hard to quantify. I call them chips on shoulders, but I find that there's a common trait amongst our most valuable entrepreneurs where they have something to prove. They were the fat kid, they were the kid that was a minority in a mostly white neighborhood, they had a really messed up family, whatever it is, there's something that drives them and oftentimes no matter how much money they make or how much fame they get, they still have this perennial fire inside them that burns and I like to say that chips on shoulders put chips in pockets. So I'm constantly looking for that as an attribute because I think that that is a sign of value that you can identify somebody that's a little bit maybe um, uh, off-putting to many but is, is typically predictive of, of either ending up in jail because they're unethical or ending up a billionaire because you know they were lucky and maybe a little bit ethical. Sounds like the uh, millennial version of uh, Ace Greenberg at Bear Stearns. The poor, hungry, yes. driven, yeah. I have a question. Um, Did you raise your hand first? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, yes. I have a question. Um, on, on selecting, not just the investment, but the people. I, I, I'm an investor in a number of private companies. Every single one of them, I know who's managing it. I know who they are. I've known them for at least a decade or more. And my wife will tell you, I have trust issues, yeah. okay? And uh, Wait, Which way, you over-trust people or you under-trust them? I, I don't trust anyone. Yeah, yeah. same. Yeah, no, I like literally my kids show up, I want fingerprints. Right. Make sure these are the yeah, real ones, yeah. okay? And, uh, and, and so how do you, when you're deploying so much capital, how do you get over the trust issue? And then what really everyone would like to hear is what was your worst burn? Oh, okay. So and what were the attributes of that last burn and what did you learn from it? So it's, it's almost ready and asking like trust but verify. Uh, the way you verify, in some cases it's technical diligence, in some cases it's milestones, I'll explain that in a second. Um, but I, I have almost the inverse of what most venture investors have as a stereotype, which is FOMO. Most people are, you know, fear of missing out, they want to be in the hot new thing. Um, I have um, uh, what I call sobs, which is the shame of being suckered. And so the, feel, the feeling when somebody walks in that they are trying to dupe me or mislead us or that I'm gonna fall sucker and pray to them growing up in Coney Island, the hucksters and the carny barkers. Like I just always assume that somebody's got an angle and agenda. And so I'm generally, if you ask any of my partners, there's 10 people on our investment team and 30 people at the firm, but they will say that Josh's number one question is, is this person a fraud? Because I'm terrified of being duped, that somebody will outsmart me and, uh, and get one past me. And there are areas, by the way, that I think are like utter bullshit and fraud today, uh, or at least fraught with fraud. Uh, a lot of stuff in, in quantum computing because there's this what I call ignorance arbitrage that a lot of people don't understand it and they don't want to admit that they don't understand it. And so people that are able to have a silver tongue and talk with sophisticated science will get past them. 
um, a lot of stuff in AI, a lot of stuff in fusion as opposed to fission in nuclear. But things where you know people in biotech, of course, there's you know tons of of stuff, and and generally the thing in biotech is always when and I, I'm friends with athletes and team owners and people that will say, hey, have you seen this thing? And when there's no scientists in the publication and they're going to athletes and trying to convince them that they'll get some edge by taking some supplement or whatever, it's almost always, you know, quackery and, and snake oil. Total um, shit. Total shit. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the second thing we do in the trust but verify is mechanistically, unlike a private equity firm that looks at a company and is buying the company, you know, almost like you take out a mortgage on a home and they put down 20% in equity and borrow you know, the other four fifths. Uh, we are funding a company and we ask a very sophisticated question, I say that tongue in cheek, which is how much money accomplishes what in what period of time? Sounds like we were talking about gambling before poker. You're, you're trying to ante up and figure out what's the next card that I'm gonna turn over and when will I see it and how much will it cost? And importantly, who will care when I flip that card over? And how does it change the odds? Now, just one other framework to, to give you. My partner, who is dresses more like these guys, my co-founder, um, more positive, more optimistic, more cheery. I am like dark angel of death, cynic. My shoes, you know, uh, have skulls on them, sort of memento mori. I expect everything's going to go wrong. Peter Abear is my co-founder. He will say, well, what if it goes right? right? What if this thing is huge? I'm always looking at things and saying, like, you know, everything is a risk. And every risk that I can identify, it could be technology risk, product risk, market risk, people risk, financing risk. Every risk that I can identify and kill. There's this great romantic view about entrepreneurs as these great risk takers. The best entrepreneurs are risk killers. They look at something and they say, I'm gonna prevent that risk from happening, and I'm gonna throw time or talent or money to prevent that thing happening. Now, the reason I think about that in this economic construct and value creation is I kill those risks. You come in as a later stage investor, you should pay a higher price than I did. And you should demand a lower quantum of return because you were taking less risk. So I think about value creation as risk reduction. Peter thinks about it more constructively, but I'm basically looking at everything as like, what can go wrong? And I'm not often fun to be around for those purposes, but. Um, uh, particularly in this current environment where financing is drying up and the cost of capital is going and exit values are declining. A lot of our companies that listened are in, in really good positions. Hmm. Mike, this first time you've ever been called cheerful? Well, this guy? Relative. He called, he, he called no. me cheerful. I was kind yeah. of... Uh, not, no, I'm cheerful. Yeah. Okay. I am cheerful. I mean, actually, we have a very similar view when I, when I look at my bigger ideas that I'm going to size up and that are a bit higher risk, which I do often. Um, I, I really frame it as... How can I be wrong? And when I get to an answer after doing a lot of work, and I get to the conclusion where I don't know how I can be wrong, that's really exciting. That's the most exciting moment for me because it means I'm not big enough. And then you want to get big enough to the point where you start getting sweaty palms because then you know you're big enough. When you start getting sweaty palms, that's the limit. And, uh, and if you don't get sweaty palms, well, then you're actually going to blow up because then you're not looking over your shoulder enough. Uh, and, and, and it brings me to think about my most legendary swindler that I've known since he came to Wall Street, the pharma bro, uh, Martin Scarelli. Mm. And uh, so everyone must know that. And I, I remember so distinctly, because you were talking about the charlatans coming through. And, uh, and I mentored him, believe it or not, uh, when he first started uh, as a portfolio manager and an analyst on Wall Street. And uh, this was 12 years ago. And I remember uh, telling my team about it. And I was just like, this guy is going to either get rich or go to jail. And I don't know what happens first. You know, that, was, that was it. And so, yeah, you really brought up a great point about the charlatans. They are so convincing and, and by the way, hard the, to shake. The, the moment of a company's inception or conception, it's often very hard to tell if the person is naive and ambitious and you know, just um, doesn't know what they don't know, which is often a virtue as an entrepreneur, or that they are witting and cunning you know, and trying to be sort of malevolently misleading. And it's, it's very difficult to tell. I'm sure when people were originally meeting with Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, uh, you know, they might have felt that like her ambitions are pure and at some point maybe they were and then they changed. I remember a large institutional investor who's a big public fund and, and uh, invested in biotechs uh, uh, asked us, what would you ask her? This was like when, before fraud had been revealed. And, and it was a simple question. Uh, they know we've got PhDs on staff, and, but, but we just said, does it work? And you'd be amazed how many people just don't ask if a technology works and don't know how much money it will take to figure out if it works. And so, yeah, does it work is a, an easy question to ask. And, and even one more step, because I was you know, in that group at this time, and when they came out with this data that we could take a drop of blood and do all of these tests on a single drop of blood, uh, literally my team, we were laughing. We thought that everyone knew that this was a fraud because 
all of these development things, and most people don't understand it, but the, the pace of scientific discovery and development is actually pretty glacial. Uh, and, it, and it's publication, peer review, publication, peer review, demonstration, um, and, and it takes years and years and years to get from A to Z to do what she did. And she did none of it. And we didn't know who did it. And uh, it had to be a fraud because if they had successfully developed any of these steps to get to that final product, we would know about it. You can't hide that. And that was the most amazing thing to me is so many were swindled on that. But to the experts in the hedge fund community, you know, we, we were hoping it would go public because we couldn't wait to short right. it. Now, what's interesting about that, and we were talking about value before, is um, you know, like the old Twain quote that a cat that sits on a hot stove will never sit on a cold one again. The aversion for uh, all the things in the diagnostic space uh, for liquid biopsy was very high following that because nobody wanted to be burned again. But I got to tell you, there are a ton of companies now that are actually making real life-saving progress in liquid biopsy where they're taking small, maybe not a single drop of blood, but small amounts of blood and be able to detect early cancers. And, and so it's a weird thing because those investors that actually went into that in spite of the fact that you had this massive Theranos fraud will end up doing quite well. Um, people that were investors in like Grail, for example, uh, which Illumina TBD if, if it ends up going through regulation, but you know, that was a big outcome. Uh, and that was effectively Theranos, you know, be, be able to detect early cancer in the blood uh, with, with very small mole molecular detection. So I have a few years on you guys, and I, I do remember once upon a time crawling under desks for, uh, for, uh, for fire drills or other types of drills. And, and, you know, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, I guess they were bothersome, but they really weren't scary. And like right now we actually are in a situation where there's, you know, some, some, some real fear going on, um, not to be a grave digger, but is there opportunity in war right now? Oh, you mean in uh, economic disruption of that? Is there opportunity? In a situation right now where we actually have a path to Armageddon, is this, is this creating opportunity for either of you to, to, to invest? Wow, that's a good one. I, I, I think uh, you know, one, one of the things that always irks me is like people will say, you know, we're at unprecedented levels of uncertainty. or you know, The world is always a dangerous place. Uh, and at various times, actually, I think it gets most dangerous when people are just most complacent, when they're not thinking about the risks that can occur. So right now, risk is ever present on people's minds, um, specifically on defense. Uh, there are opportunities in defense because there are needs and challenges in defense. And so there are companies and technologies that are being brought to market, I think, at an unprecedented pace. We've been investing in defense for a decade plus. Um, from technologies that we provided to Intel community to drones in pretty much every facet of the earth from um, uh, air, land, sea, uh, cyber, space, uh, beyond. Um, I'll give you two interesting companies in the space, um, and then I'll give you one that actually, um, or I'll give you three. One, one was a, a company called Clarify, which is st still a private company and growing, and uh, they made a technology that interpolated all of the aerial imagery from drones and um, uh, aerial platforms. And, and this became very controver controversial some years ago because you had a contingent inside of Google that was very against uh, working on military industrial complex and working on defense. And so they staged a walkout in this Project Maven program. And this company of ours was a beneficiary of that because they did not share those same concerns. They actually thought it was a virtuous thing that you want the technology in the hands of war fighters on the front line, women and men who are risking everything uh, to not be disadvantaged. And they thought it was a virtuous thing to be able to discriminate between a man that was walking home from a farm with a pickaxe on a shovel and a man that was walking with an AK-47 intending to go to a school to do bad things. And so uh, th that was an example of a company where we had to make a moral judgment, was that a good thing to invest in our overlaying uh, value system for that is that if it's reducing human suffering, it is a net positive, and we thought that that was. We then invested in a company that um, has become a very significant company. We invested after having um, breakfast with the founders and a chairperson who's a fellow VC at Balfazar down in Soho about five years ago uh, called Anderil. And the founder is a guy, Palmer Lucky. Palmer was a young guy who started a company called Oculus, sold it to Facebook, made a lot of money, had some uh, FU views and made FU money. Um, uh, I don't agree with his politics, but I, I can't disagree that he is an absolute technological genius. And he really wanted to build Stark Industries. He wanted to build a modern defense contractor that would attract the best and the brightest from Silicon Valley, change the economic model from defense contractors from being cost plus like the uh, Lockheed's, Raytheon's, L3's, Boeing's, et cetera, and basically have more software and hardware technology like margins of 50 to 70%. And what that meant was that you were gonna have to fund it all yourself and then go to the government and sell it and say, if you want this thing, then you're gonna buy it and you're gonna pay top margins rather than getting a contract and developing it in this cost plus four, five, six percent margins. 
Um, that business is now uh, just under five years old, hundreds of millions in revenue, has done its third acquisition, and will start to roll up the industry. They have about a billion and a half of cash and uh, just absolutely stunning. Uh, and, and you've got people on the company there politically that are both left and right. Um, uh, they've been contacted and are involved in some of the most important conflicts that are uh, occurring today. But, but, but that one's quite interesting. The, the third one is a company that we originally funded for oceanographic and environmental stuff called SailDrone. And as it uh, sounds like, it's a drone that looks like a sailboat. We started with one of them. They were bright red and orange, and we got a fleet of them, and they're helping for cruise ships to navigate to find you know, a place where they can spend less on, um, on fuel. They're helping with fisheries and environmental stuff and climate and environment. And uh, two of our partners, one was former head of SOCOM, a guy, Tony Thomas, four-star general, uh, overseeing 90,000 elite troops, and uh, another guy, Hondo Gertz, who was undersecretary of the Navy. They both come on uh, to LOX, and, and we get them involved in this company, and they say, you know, if you paint this thing a different color, it could be really useful in a different market, which was military. So the U.S. Navy now deploys these as part of the, the fleet, these autonomous drones that can go into hurricanes and go into the Bering Straits and go into the Straits of Hormuz. And about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the first week of September, uh, there was some international news to cover the Washington Post. Iran had seized two of these drones. And uh, within, I think, 40 minutes, uh, a Navy destroyer came and said, hey, those are ours, give them back. But uh, that was uh, pretty hairy for a minute. So yes, we're, we are long defense in this current market. Mike, anything interesting? Uh, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try this. So, so, so uh, uh, guys who watch the show know that Mike Reed and I uh, a tangle on inflation. Um, it's been an unfair battle. He was wrong. Um, <laughs> but away from that, if you guys could each, you know, what is inflation? Where is it going? And how would each of you invest in inflation based upon the, your thoughts? You keep coming up with these great questions. This is really impressive. We didn't do any prep for this before, and he's just rattling them off. Uh, well, I believe what's happening right now with inflation uh, and, and look, we had an experiment uh, over the past decade, essentially modern monetary theory, and uh, doled out about $4 trillion in new money. People literally got checks, turned around, bought a TV. Now they had to remake the TV and go and get the materials and all the supplies and all that. And so everything got pushed up. And we're sort of living in that. And that's the most immediate problem with modern monetary theory, just giving people money so they spend it. It, uh, it is inflationary. But the, the second problem that is much more long lasting that I'm truly concerned about over the long term is, uh, the, I, I like to call it the sort of um, the consequence of the woke economy. And that uh, minerals, mining, energy are not ESG, so there is not a lot of funding available to invest in these things, uh, which are necessary. And the demand for these things are inelastic. And this has been going on for a decade now. And surprise, surprise, we're running out of reserves or access or cheap access to this material. And the, the consequence is prices go up because the demand is inelastic. And so in order to rectify that, there actually has to be a meaningful political change. Uh, and, and of course, you know, conflicts like Ukraine make it worse. But then there's also the derivative parts that they never thought about. Uh, most forgot that nat gas energy is used to make fertilizer, and fertilizer is used to grow everything. And what people may not know right now in the US, fertilizer prices year on year, by my sources, are looking about 30% plus. And that means that the food crisis that we're going through right now, and it, much less so here, but things are still, you know, uh, food prices by and large are up teens over the last two years, high teens. And, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a real drag. The rest of the world, it's worse. But next year, all that fertilizer high price is going to get priced into the food again. So it's actually going to be even higher next year. And these are the consequences of um, the political movement to sap the access to raw materials and energy. And uh, so that, that is my great fear on the long duration inflation problem that I don't know how we get out of. So I think we'll have a moment in the intermediate term where we do have an economic slowdown, rates will go down, inflation will go down, but the moment that it turns, we're gonna be at a new pl plateau on a lot of these input costs. And if that means uh, higher yields everywhere, 
And I know you might, you might say, well, what's the problem? I know you're, you're from a high yield environment, right? This is a, a different generational investing. We, you know, my investment career has been from 2000 to now. So I'm just a young guy. And, uh, <laughs> right. and, uh, and so uh, I, I really look at a high interest rate environment as uh, extremely risky. Uh, especially transitioning from low to high. A lot, lot, lot of things have to go wrong in that transition. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a few different views here. The first is a view that I've had for a while that I've called biflation. And the idea is that you have sort of two components of this. You have consumer discretionary stuff, which everybody has, you know, the Pelotons and the Nikes and the Under Armour and everything that people pulled forward from COVID in three years of demand uh, is actually seeing buildup of inventories, declining prices. And so you almost see a deflationary effect in some components. We talk about inflation as this broad sweep, but just like unemployment, there's, there's a, a, a breakdown in the constituent components. The second piece, so, so, so I actually see middle class seeing most of the stuff that they've been buying incrementally that are discretionary and not necessary declining in price and being deflationary, whereas the poor and the hardest hit for food and fuel, uh, let alone the cost of capital for you know, uh, mortgages and car loans and everything else rising, uh, is really painful. And so that, to me, is where you're seeing the hardest uh, uh, problems. The interesting speculation from there is what happens socially. Um, I, 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 my speculation as it relates to employment is you end up with the poor being near fully employed with 100% of every incremental dollar they're earning going towards uh, uh, spending and, and no saving. Um, and, uh, and I think you see mass layoffs in, in, in middle class and white collar jobs. I think there's, I don't know, if you get on any plane and you look around 10 to 30% of those jobs, like they're bullshit jobs. I don't know what, what they do. Um, I, I think a lot of those are going to be uh, the first to be cut uh, in, in a much more significant way than people have expected with these sort of 10, 20, 30 percent cuts. Um, my world of high tech venture capital, I mean, you're just going to see half the companies disappear. So there's going to be mass layoffs of, of young people. You have to remember that, uh, you know, the last crisis 14 years ago, uh, 2008, 2009, was really a credit, liquidity, collateral crisis. It wasn't really an equity crisis. And people say, well, we had an equity downturn you know, in, in March of 2020, which was a short blip between you had record fiscal and monetary intervention. Um, when, when we started Lux nearly 20 years ago, it was coming out of an equity bubble burst where young people actually suffered real material loss and, and loss of jobs. You haven't seen down rounds in private companies. You haven't seen rifts, reductions in force, layoffs. Um, I think that is coming in, in, a, in a very serious way. And so I think that the next two or three years, the unemployment picture will probably get us up to, I think you said 5% uh, when we were talking, but uh, maybe 6 7%. Um, uh, I think the Fed doesn't blink until you get below 4% uh, in, inflation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think we end up with, uh, you know, four and a half, five, five and a half, uh, uh, tenure. And, uh, I, I do think that for assets, that means, uh, you know, older generation that has gone from saving to now de-saving with assets that they were, uh, you know, large holders of selling off and, uh, putting them into fixed income again and, uh, risk assets being relatively un uh, unattractive. And then the counter to inflationary environment, I think healthcare does pretty well because it's a constant. And I think things that are heavy industry dependent that are hard to replicate. So looking at uh, sophisticated automated manufacturing semiconductors and things like that, that would be uh, very expensive to replicate will we'll do quite well too. Notwithstanding that my partner and good friend Mike Green is, is was wrong on inflation, we, we do meet together on demographics. Uh, and, and I would propose, we would agree probably that the 70s inflation yeah, we like to call it Johnson Guns and Butter, but truth be told, it was the baby boom generation entering the workforce. Um, peak age, you know, 30, 32, 35 is right in the late 70s, and they're demanding houses and cars and baby carriages, washing machines. They're demanding it from a World War II generation that was smaller, both because of birth and also because well, they died. Um, and therefore, you get this inflation. And we've had this down cycle here in the last 40 years as your um, boomers have been productive and have been producing and, and becoming more efficient. Um, and now we're kind of going to rotate again as the boomers retire. They, they take their winnings from the stock market or the bond market and they, and they, and they quit. So it's, it's not a lost, uh, lost people. I mean, they, they're, they're, they made their money and they're retiring now. And the, and the millennials, um, they're entering the workforce now. And they're entering maybe seven years later because they have kids later than, than I did. Um, and, and, and therefore, we have this kind of grinding of the gears right now about uh, rates and inflation. And I wrote a piece um, oh, seven, eight years ago saying we were going to get inflation and higher rates um, about now, because this is 
20, 21, 2, 3, 4, 5 is when you actually get this upturn in the labor force growth rate. And you can go look at the pieces I was writing in 2014, 15, 16 about this, because population is population is what it is. It's baked in the cake. Let's you Benjamin Button people and get bored backwards. So the question I have for you guys is this. I look like I kind of segue around these little circles. Well, here. I, can, can I ask a, a question about that sure. too? Because against that backdrop, uh, you don't have a constant in, 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 or against that setup, you don't have a constant in the background, which is uh, uh, globalization. Uh, there seems to me that you had 20, 30, 40 years nearly of uh, uh, shifting jobs to China, uh, being able to uh, benefit as uh, uh, they would effectively lower the far end of the curve for us and the cost of capital. And all that feels like it's reversing. And so against the backdrop demographics, you also have this deflationary force for two plus decades that seems to be reversing and exacerbating. Exactly. Um, so, so following along this thought here is, as we're grinding the gears of this giant demographic wave kind of reversing course, how is that going to impact how you invest and how you view the markets? Oh, they always look at me first. Because so. <laughs> your horizon's a little shorter term. Yes, yes. Um, You'll step I, on the landmine. I, I think about it a lot, actually, uh, um, about the, the cost of labor and those, the, as one of the input costs. And um, the only thing that we have to look forward to, there's two things that we can, I look at how we get out of a problem, right? So how, do, how does it solve? And for the US, at least, uh, we're fortunate in that we are a country that can accept anybody to come in, essentially. Uh, you know, we speak a common language, and, and in certain areas, everyone speaks every language. And so you can immigrate here and do well. And you can't say that in Greece or Italy. Or, you, know, you have to be part of the culture, speak the language. And so we have this great ability to import the labor that we might need to keep costs down and productivity high. And that sort of solves that problem, too. Uh, and so those are the two outs that I can come up with it. But for many countries that are, you know, China, for instance, I mean, they're in a real pickle so far as uh, wage growth. Uh, you know, they've, they've now the Chinese, uh, you know, retail individuals, they have debts. They have a mortgage. They have all these things they have to pay, and they need more. And well, so, their demographic's a disaster. The country's going to be, what, uh, one third smaller in, in 50 years. What is even worse is that they essentially don't have a pension system. So if you have a, a couple get married, those two are taking care of four elderly parents. So they have fewer children because they have to take care of these older parents for the rest of their lives. And so it's an incredible financial strain on them and it, it doesn't allow for you know, family foundation and having uh, more children. So it, it actually accelerates the problem. And uh, Italy is not terribly different. South Korea. Uh, China is, of course, the worst. Uh, and I don't know how they get out of that. So I sort of look at the US and I say, I know how we get out of this. I don't know how all of them get out of it. So bad, bad things are going to happen over there. So I don't invest there. I'll trade it. But any big idea coming out of there, I am so uh, worried about what's happening to the pound right now, British pound, what's happening in Japan to the yen. And for instance, in the Eurozone, if Putin keeps applying pressure, I think it's just a matter of time before Italy holds a referendum and leaves. And it might be a matter of short time. You know, these things happen pretty quick. And so there's incredible risks of disruption. But all these disruptive elements really come down to the population and the demographics without any solutions. So I'm very, I, I, as an investor, I can't find a solution to it, but I can on how I invest. And so I'll be much, much, much more US centric. I'll uh, <clears throat> give you a framework for how we're thinking about investing and the sort of three main strategies that we're, uh, we think are gonna work well. Uh, everybody's got you know, personal visceral experiences that they lived. And as I noted, you know, the last crisis, if you were roughly uh, you know, graduating college around that time, 14, 15 years ago, you're 36, 37 years, at, in, in that, uh, 36, 37 years old now. Um, there's a lot of people that entered venture that are 36, 37 years old that today have never just lived through that equity downturn. So my model for this, having lived through it, was Q3 2000, where you saw, you know, the sort of March 2000 
uh, dot com bubble burst, and then it was almost like a ball. It was just like high volatility, it bounced along for a while, and just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you sort of had these range bound markets, but that were just like declining. Eventually, people went through this process of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, like five stages of grieving, and either opt out of the markets or realize like there was no equivalent of a Fed put, there was no incremental buyer that was coming in, there was no new pools of capital, and these things just labored you know, for roughly 15, 16, 17 years with dividends reinvested until they got back to those March 2000 levels. So that's my model for where we are in sort of high-tech equity, that we will have a similar setup. Uh, in the public side of things, you had the rise from 02 to 07 of some of the most famous long short hedge fund managers, uh, people that were able to identify great compounders and really analyze balance sheets. I laugh when I follow, when I look at people on Twitter that are you know, posting like, and they're not doing it with tongue in cheek. They're like, what is EBITDA and why does it matter? And you know, they're gonna rediscover, like people did in 2000, 2002, basic economics and how to analyze a business and read a 10Q and 10K. And so you, you ended up having this five year period where you had this rise of long short hedge funds, great compounders on the long side, people that could identify fads and frauds and technological obsolescence on the short side. Um, and I think that the same thing is gonna happen over the next five, six, seven year period. On the venture side, against that backdrop, my view is that there's three strategies you can deploy. And I call them bubble, anti-bubble, and consolidation. Bubble is not hoping for another bubble, as the bumper sticker said about 20 years ago, please God, let there be another bubble. Um, it is putting companies in a protective bubble for the very things that Mike was just talking about, the volatility and vicissitudes of the market, Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, resurgence of Trump, domestic chaos, who knows? We just spun a company um, out of uh, a big tech company, it'll be announced in about a, a month, that is uh, focused on the digitization of olfaction, the ability to give our machines a sense of smell, just like they can record video and they can record sound, the idea that uh, you, you can record smell. Uh, they've got uh, two and a half years of cash. So you know, 30 months of cash, uh, actually they have a little bit more, but, but that's the minimum for a new company that they have to be funded for. Now in the past, you could fund a company for six months, a year, and you could rely on the benevolence of strangers. You could bet on some large growth fund or a, a crossover fund or some sovereign or somebody that was gonna put money at really low cost of capital at some crazy price. And you can't expect that now. You can expect that in venture, a lot of funds are under reserved, the amount of money that they keep to invest in future rounds, that their LPs may have denominator effects and may not be able to make capital calls, something you saw in 07, 08, 09 for uh, allocators into private equity. So strategy one is put people in a bubble so that they're protected from the chaos. Strategy two is the anti-bubble. Now that the bubbles pop, particularly in my world, where valuations were at these crazy multiples, now they're at like slightly less crazy multiples, but still somewhat crazy on a relative basis historically, um, you can get late stage assets at early stage prices. And so you're looking for the capital market dislocation, the divestiture, the impaired cap table, the set of owners of the business as opposed to the balance sheet or the, the income statement or the, or the cash flow statement. The company's doing well, but its investors don't have the means to continue to fund it. And that's when you can get these situations. As one example, we had a company called Luxterra, uh, had some old school VCs in it about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, those people were out of money and they either called in rich or their investors weren't given money for an annex fund to keep going. And so that thing was sitting at a 250 million-ish post money valuation. Us and NEA came in at a 10 million pre and recapped the company and refresh management, made them whole on equity. And we ended up selling that to Cisco for $660 million. There will be isolated examples like that where you can identify a great company, great team, great technology that just has this impaired cap table. The third strategy after bubble and anti-bubble is consolidation. And this is where the companies that we have put a lot of money into or have war chest balance sheets are able to uh, prey on other people's uh, weak cap tables. And that's consolidating and rolling up their sector. Because when there's an abundance of capital, lots of companies get formed, there's dispersion, just like in an ecosystem. And when shit hits the fan, it recongeals, you know, and there's very few companies and, and people call it quits. And so I think that um, whether it's in biotech, whether it's in defense, that there's gonna be consolidation. The people that will consolidate will be the people that have um, really big war chest balance sheets. So those are the three strategies that we're deploying into. The bubble protect the companies for a long period of time, anti-bubble take advantage of these late stage businesses now at early stage prices, and then consolidation where uh, if you've got a strong balance sheet, you can roll up your sector. Okay, I, I had a question. How do you deal right now, you said there's a lot of discrepancy on what these privates should be valued at. And honestly, it kind of changes on a monthly basis on uh, whatever the trend is for the moment. How are you doing that and marking your book? And the reason why I say this, and I'll give an example why, a very good friend of mine uh, is invested, he's a public fund, public, and he has private fund too. And uh, there was an asset on it, and he, um, he wanted to mark it down a substantial amount for this quarter. And, uh, and the accountant called him up, and not his company, but the, the outside auditor called him up and said, uh, you, you're marking this down 60%. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't reveal the number. 
uh, goes, yes, yes, as well. There are four others involved, the three or four others that are involved that he's, they're auditing too, they're accounting for, and they're marking it up 20. So all of a sudden, this auditor has to make a decision. Either you change it from what you think it's priced to actually up to mark your book, or I'm going to drop you as a client because I can't turn around and tell all these guys that you can't do this. And that, that was an amazing, and I believe that that's happening now everywhere. You know, there, there was a, uh, an anecdote, um, Swenson, Dave Swenson of Yale who passed, um, uh, would, one of the reasons that he had avoided some of the big losses in the private equity boom uh, in 07, 08, was he, and even venture in 2000, is he would go to his venture managers, and the venture managers really value him as an LP. And they would say, hand to your heart, what is this thing worth? Don't tell me what it's on paper. Don't tell me what somebody at arm's length did that you know, some crossover fund came and priced this thing up. Like, what would you pay today for this asset? And so he had his formal you know, marks, and that was pre-FAS 157, where he had his sort of <coughs> revalue marks and incorporate public comps. But he would just say, hand to your heart, what is this thing worth? And because they valued the long-term relationship with Yale and didn't want to lose them as a, as a limited partner, uh, they were honest about that and honest about their marks. Now, in private markets, you can take these marks up and down. It doesn't really matter. What matters is at the end of the day, what are you selling this thing for? And we're only managing for cash on cash returns. We're not worried okay. about IRRs and interim. And so if we almost think about it, even though we have many LPs, we think about it, if you just had one LP and that LP only cared about the amount of cash that they give you and the amount of cash that you're delivering back to them, I don't care if I take an 80% write down. If I believe that the company is going to be valuable long term, I'll take the 80% write down and then we share the story and they're seeing where our incremental dollars are going in. Uh, and I, I think that there are a lot of people that are playing games, and, and many of those people, as you go through this denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, you will see this literally in the terms of um, sort of like old Carl Icahn quote, like your price, my terms. You will see the terms get very sophisticated and structure get very sophisticated, and there will be a lot of new investors in venture that just don't know what they're doing and are going to get exploited and taken advantage of. Those terms will go from, hey, we just financed this at this crazy price. Let's do an extension to that round. We need to raise some more money. Okay, and suckers will do that. Suckers will give some more money. Or you can look at the quality of the investors. You see an SPV with like, you know, dentists and doctors and widows, and you just want to avoid those companies because you know that they're going to be fallen angels soon. The next phase after an extension of a round is, okay, we're going to give some inducement to existing or new investors. So we give a positive kicker. We give you warrants. We give you a liquidation preference so that you're senior in the capital structure. The next thing after that is, okay, we're going to punish the non-participating investors because it just ain't fair. If a new investor is coming in or existing investor stepping up, I shouldn't have to carry your dead weight. And so then you put in a pay-to-play, which basically says if you don't put in your pro rata into this round, your preferred stock is going to convert to common and it starts maybe at a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, but then it goes to a 40-to-1 ratio. So you're basically being washed out. And then you have outright recapitalizations and restructuring, which an entire generation of younger investors, uh, I'm sure somebody was saying this to us when we were first starting, has never been through, but we have. And I think that that's going to be the path that, that ends up uh, playing out. I have a question for each of you. I'm going to ask you a question, Michael. I'll give you a second to think about it. OK, so with respect to your nice pink sport coat here, um, let's kind of build Buckley the question. Resolved, the only way to process the baby boom generation is to go single payer. You can think about that. Josh, you seem to like the phrase headlines versus trend lines. Why don't you give us a quick, could be the clock's running down here. What, what does that mean? Well, I think the, uh, the, the psychology of looking at what everybody's looking at. And um, you know, front page news is, um, uh, a sort of a measure of you know the the current um, uh, uh, thing du jour. You know you can find equally cogent arguments on both sides, and you're trying to uh, you know look for the thing that that nobody else is looking for. So uh, I read voraciously. I try to understand what the headlines are saying and what it implies in terms of expectations. You can look at prices and also see implied expectations in that. But I'm always looking for like what is the thing that nobody else is looking for, and that's often you know on page C24 and in in, in non obvious sources. Um, and so people are focused on the headlines. That's what drives emotion. It's what drives our conversations. It's what we're all talking about. And often the most important thing is not in the headlines. It's looking at the long-term trends. And the trends for me, oftentimes in technology, are you know what is the directional arrow of progress? And I've given these examples a lot publicly. But um, you know if you look at uh, lighting, we went from uh, flame to incandescent bulb to LED. We're not going back to sconces and torches in hallways. Uh, in transportation, we went from walking to riding horses to horse-drawn carriages to uh, cars to electric cars to autonomous electric cars. You're not going back to horses and horseshit in the street. Uh, in computing, you went from mechanical disks to solid-state computing, and you're not going back to moving parts. And same thing now in satellite communication. And so you find these directional arrows of progress. Those are the trend lines. 
And it doesn't matter what the headlines are because that is going back to sort of the time arbitrage of many of this stuff. That's what people are talking about today or next week. And, and so you really zoom out and you try to find those directional arrows of progress. And, and, and that is, especially when everybody's focused over here, I think is an opportunity to make money when you know, the thing that you find as the trend is, is underappreciated. Mr. Pink? Single payer healthcare system. Um, I think that uh, evidence is clear. Uh, everyone really enjoys a free lunch, you know. Uh, and, and it appears- Like we've been for, getting like, like a half hour, right? Yeah, was, <laughs> and, uh, it, but, but it appears free, but there's actually an incredible cost to it. Uh, it, it. And one of the biggest costs to that is if you want something to turn into a money pit like you cannot believe and also get horrific service with no positive feedback mechanism to make it better, give it to the government to run. They will find that way because it now is a political entity. Isn't your friend Martin the flip side of the coin? Who's my friend? Oh, Martin Screlly? Yeah. No, he doesn't care. He's a sociopath. <laughs> so. No, but I mean, that's where you get like insulin costing 300 bucks or, or little stabby needles costing yeah. 500 a pop. I mean, that, well, can't be, that can't be good public policy. It isn't, but that gaming has been eliminated. So there was a correction system in place. Took a little longer. Some people did suffer from that. But over the long term, it's much, much, much better. It has really put a spotlight on price increases. And, uh, and so a lot of companies have actually gone bankrupt, many, because of that. They've been playing, buying assets, jacking it up, big money, and now they can't do it. And they're stuck with all these crappy assets and went bankrupt. Uh, many, many of them. Um, so I, 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 am, I, I don't. I understand the allure of a single payer system, uh, but uh, the consequence of that will be twofold. One, the service will end up being horrific and incredibly expensive for a long period of time. And number two, it will strangle all innovation. And you made a great citation here about going from walking to a bike, to a horse, to a carriage. Medicine is the same way. If you, uh, 20 years ago, if you got breast cancer, you had very few treatment alternatives. Now you have amazing testing that can get it genetically in advance, so you don't even have it. You're just probably gonna get it, but with an incredibly high probability, so we can help with that. And then if you do get something like that, you, we can capture it early through testing and treatment. And even if it is later, uh, the survival rate for a longer period of time, you can get a longer, better life out of that. And all of that is essentially because of the United States and the innovation that comes out well, of the Public US. policy good that I could buy my mother's Farsiga online at a quarter of the price in the correct wrapper from Canada or, or, or England. That's a public policy good? Well, Just checking. as you know, there is a logistical issue with that and that the FDA can't actually guarantee that that item is that item because you're buying it from overseas. And so that is one of the big problems about getting it, because the FDA doesn't know where it actually is from. And so I understand the issues with that, because what if you were buying not from Canada, but from Turkey or Rwanda? The or point maybe they bought it why, from Rwanda. And why do we okay. allow our companies to go and sell it for a tenth the price in foreign countries? So whatever. Well, that's part of the free market system. And like anything, there's, it's imperfect. It's not free market. People in Canada, the, the rugs are regulated in Germany and in Europe. The, that's anti-regulation. Oh, I meant free market in the U.S. That's what I meant. It's, it's generally a pretty free market. It is quasi-regulated. Uh, but the free market part, especially on drugs, they're negotiating with the governments on a price and supply. Getting diagnosed with breast cancer here versus somewhere else in the world, uh, the outcomes are infinitely better here as so long as, especially if you have a complicated case, and you never know who's going to be complicated until you are, but often the solutions in other countries with a single payer health system, you have X, Y, and Z, and that is it. That is our treatment, you are done. Next one, fentanyl patch. And the US frequently will go the length, whatever the length is that you want for yourself and your family. And, uh, and I think that uh, for me, the problems with it certainly are smaller than the outcomes. So we're not going single tremendous. payer or we are? I, I, oh, I'll we are that. absolutely not going to not go to a single payer. Uh, the, the probability of that is incredibly low. Uh, but I will share one thing. 20 
years ago, I had a conversation with Hillary Clinton's healthcare guy Ira in D.C. Hmm? Ira Magaziner? No. Oh, sorry. No. Um, Wendell Primus, that was his name. And, and this was before it all got turned into, you know, Hillary Clinton with this big single payer system. So it, the spotlight was not on it. And I'm in D.C., I'm having lunch with him, and I'm like, why are you even working on this? This is just a logistical albatross. How can you gain from this? And he said, if we can nationalize the healthcare system, the Democrats will never lose again any election because doctors and nurses and everyone else will be union workers. And that was their goal. Not healthcare. It was dominating elections. And that was the most eye-opening experience of my political career, if you will, understanding how these people think. And so I think that the more things that are taken away from the federal government, the better. Well, we thought that uh, we couldn't fill an hour. It seems like we uh, did a pretty good job of that. I, I, I want to ask, a, can I take a question? Is the clock right now, guys? I'll, I'll answer anyways. Yeah, what's up, man? rest of the world kind of rides American innovation for free. Do you think there's any way to spread that cost? That's an incredibly good point. And we are paying for the innovation of the world. And they are benefiting from it to a degree riding the coattails. Though many of the drugs here that have been developed aren't even available there because they just won't pay for it because it's not worth a life. It's not worth a benefit. And it's because you have technocrats deciding who is going to live and who is going to die. And we just have a different approach over here. And so even though it's uneven, even though it's unfair, life is unfair. And not all outcomes are the same. And so what I have to do is take it and say, it is imperfect, but I can't actually think of anything better. Okay, I've been given the hook. I thank you all for your attention. Thanks to our uh, two guests over here.